Wa e hone re kroria ki te atua maungarongo ki te whenua whakaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa tihei a Māori ora. Uh, tuatahi, uh, ko rātua manga manga te maunga, ko ipi piri te moana. Ko nga tuki matawhauru o te waka, ko patu keha me ngāti kūte ngā hapu, uh, ko ngā pū i te iwi, ko rāwhati te whenua, ko rāwhati te marae, ko Sunny Bill Williams a hau. Kia ora. Good morning. You good? Some of you bastards need to loosen up just a little bit. <laughs> you're like you're all super, super. Some of you look at me now like you're all stuck on the wrong TV channel. <laughs> Some of you look at me like, who, who left it on the Maori channel? Oh, change it over to CNN. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike King. And um, normally I'd be here today talking uh, about mental health, but I had a really good chat with Blair. And you've got some amazing people here already talking about mental health. Um, how, how about a, a big round of applause for the Voices of Hope ladies? They are just, you know. These, these two young ladies are the voices that we need to hear at Ministry of Health and government level and they're constantly being ignored but no one is more experienced in this field than Jazz and G. They're just phenomenal, phenomenal young women and I'm going to battle like hell to make sure that their voice is heard um, by this new government. They tick every single box. They have lived experience and they are, uh, they are young and they listen. So that's that's what we need, not a bunch of academics and clinicians who are sitting there reading about this shit in a book. We need actually people out there with lived experience. So yeah, I love, I love you ladies, you, you just keep doing what you do. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, um, my talk today is, is, is relevant to mental health. Um, the financial industry is all over the place, everyone hates you, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> but yeah, we all hate you. Um, you know, there's only two headlines in every newspaper now, um, bullying and, oh, that is you, you guys. So, um, so <laughs> it's unfair because they don't know you like I do. I mean, I, like I'm not like them. I love you guys. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about, there's a lot of uncertainty in your industry. There's a lot of uncertainty. So what I thought would be the most appropriate thing and the most beneficial thing to you guys that I could talk about today is transition, um, transitioning. Because I mean, you know, everyone's uncertain about where their jobs are now and, and what we're going to do and where we're going to go. And I know a lot of people in this room are thinking about where I'm going to go and what does that look like. So what I thought I'd do for you today is I would, I would share with you my journey transitioning from a... Um, uh, uh, a well-rewarded, shall I say, um, stand-up comedian and moving into the mental health realm, which was a, a, which was a huge shift. Um, I'll share with you my journey through there and then um, I, will, uh, I will share with you the three key points that you need to make success for a successful transition. And in those three key points that I make are the three biggest traps that people make and the three biggest mistakes. So um, my, my journey uh, from, from successful stand-up comedian to um, mental health advocate started in 2012, at the end of 2012, um, when I was approached by a school in Northland, a small rural school called Taipa, um, Taipa uh, Community School. Um, and I was asked uh, by the principal to go up there and speak to them, to speak to their kids after five young people from their local area took their lives in the space of two months. Um, now, my approach to this um, started a couple of months before this, after a, um, my journey into this whole speaking about mental health, started because of a wonderful um, district court judge um, who gave me 200 hours of community service um, for, for riding my motorbike uh, without a licence. I thought 200 hours of community service was a bit strong for riding a motorbike without, without a licence. I, I, know, I know real criminals who get less than that. Um, but as it turned out, it was, it was the best thing that could ever have happened to me. Now, when he did this, I was really angry. I was sitting at home and I was fuming. And I was sitting there, how am I going to repay my community 200 hours of service when I got this call? 
Um, so I decided to do this as my, um, my serve. So I went up to, um, uh, the principal rang me and asked me to go up and speak to his kids. Um, my, my approach was going to be, I was going to go up, I'm a comedian, I was going to go tell the kids some jokes, tell them to get over themselves and stop killing themselves. That was my, that was my strategy. Why? Because I'm a moron. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, like, I'm an adult. I know everything and they know nothing. So um, I went up to Cyber Area School. There's 180 kids at the school. 180 from, you know, from babies right through um, to year 13s. Now, when I walked into the school hall, you could feel the heaviness. You could, you could feel the despair in the room, the distinct lack of hope. And in the time that it took me to walk from the back of the hall to the front of the hall, I knew jokes weren't going to be appropriate. And I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And as I stood there in front of them naked, because I had nothing, I just... I just decided, like my inner critic was bashing me, going, no, you're a loser now. What are you going to do now? Um, And I just decided to be truthful. So I started talking to these kids about my journey through my mental health ups and downs and my battle, my eternal battle with my inner critic. My inner critic has told me my whole life that I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. Other people that are better than me, my whole life I'd felt like I was a disappointment to my dad. You know, my dad was the biggest hero in my life and every time he looked at me, I just felt like I wasn't measuring up to the mark and I would, my, my inner critic would be relentlessly belting me. People's normal inner critic undermines your logical thinking and, and has you reviewing the things that you, you, that you say, the things that you do and the things that you see every day. My inner critic is a relentless bully. I've never been able to take a compliment because my inner critic has told me my whole life, I'm not worthy of compliments. Other people are worthy of compliments. You're not worthy. And I started sharing my story with the kids. And as I'm sharing my story, these kids went from being slumped back in their seats, going, yeah, here's another lecture from an old fool. And suddenly they were sitting up. And they were looking down the aisles at their friends as if to say, can, can, can you believe this guy? Here's, here's a guy talking about himself. And I believe in that moment, I was the first truly flawed adult in these kids' lives. And I was, as, I was, as I was sharing my story, these kids started to recognize their journey in my story. And I wasn't pointing the finger at them. I was just talking about the things that I was doing and the things that I was saying and the things that I'd been through. And for the first time, they realized that they weren't alone. And when I did this thing with, um, so I, I do this thing where I, you know, I talk about the conversations I have with myself. How many of you have conversations with themselves? Hands up, you have conversations with themselves. Hands up, hands up, hands up, you have conversations with yourself. Hands up, hands up. Yeah, there will be a test, so keep your hands up. I'm serious. <laughs> put, your, put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up, hands up, hands up. Hey, yes, thank you. Hands up, hands up. Like, like you, you don't have conversations with yourself, young lady? You're having a conversation with yourself right now, aren't you? You're going, shit, I should have put my hand up earlier. <laughs> and, and, and so I talk to them about the conversations I have with myself, the beating myself up, my voice of reason, trying to lift me up, being drowned out by the noise. And then I ask the question, how many of you have, have an inner critic? So how many of you have an inner critic? About the same amount of hands went up. And as the hands went up, I said, look around. Look at me, now look around. And the next sound I heard was, Holy, I'm not the, 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 the relief that went around this room was unbelievable. I, I finished sharing my story and um, the guidance counselor at the school came up to me afterwards and she went, wow. Um, I say, talk to all the kids and she goes, she comes up to me, she goes, I've got five kids at the school under suicide watch, can you go and talk to them? And I was like, yeah, sure. No, no, I've never talked to a suicide kid before, but yeah, sure. So I walked into this room. I've got six kids, right? At the time I had five. These kids looked exactly like my kids. They're all slumped back in their seats, all had smiles on their face. I was like, hey, how you going? They go, good. I'm like, well, apparently you want to kill yourself. Yep. <laughs> I said, perhaps you better tell your face because you don't look like you want to kill yourselves. Um, so I started talking to these kids. And I said to the first kid, so, you know, what's your issue? 
he went, oh, da 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 And the things he told me, I was like, holy crap, really? Really? I said, you're the most amazing young person. Because it was, I, I couldn't carry that. I couldn't carry that. So I'm like, I said, have you talked to your parents? Have you talked to your teachers? And he just went, no. And I'm like, why not? He said, because every time you talk to your parents, they make it about them and they make you feel worse. I'm like, well, that's a bit harsh. Give me an example. He went, da-da-da. I said, oh, shit, I'll do that. Da-da-da, I do that. Da-da-da, I do that. Da-da-da, 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 I do that. And just as he had recognised himself in my story, I, I started to recognise myself in his story. My journey as a parent, I was like, holy shit, I do all of those things. So in that situation, I did what every adult does. I went to the next kid, what about you? <laughs> Looking for an answer. The next kid there was a young gay Māori boy, super good looking kid. And I said, so what about you? He says, first off, I'm gay, dumb adult. Well, that must be really tough, eh, mate? Must be really tough in a gang area like this, really staunch area, wrestling with your sexuality like that. That must be really tough. Like in that patronising tone, he went, I'm sweet with being gay. I'm like, okay, so... What's the problem? He said, I'm sick and tired of being invalidated by the world. I was like, okay, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, he said, every time I hear the word faggot, homo, gay boy, pufta, I think this is how the world sees me. And I think, what's the point? In that moment, my heart dropped because not only was I saying these words out loud, I was saying them on radio, on television in my stand-up, and I was actively encouraging other people to say those words. And this is the first time in my life that I realised that my words were not only killing people, they were killing young people. I listened to these other three kids' stories straight afterwards, and just as I'd recognised themselves in my story, I recognised myself as a parent, and I felt sick. I spent about five hours with these kids, phenomenal. They were just unbelievable. And by the end, I made a promise to them that I would not, I would change. I would not say these words and I would be a better mum. I'd be, be a better dad and a mum. I'd just, I'd be a better person. So that night, I, I, there was the loneliest drive I've ever had. So, so it was five and a half hours from Kaitaia back down to, down to Auckland. I had to go straight to work. And the, the, talk, uh, the, the gig that I had was at the Glen Eden RSA. There were 250 people in this room. The other three comedians were getting smashed by the audience, getting smashed. And um, my mate who was with me said, what are you going to do here? I said, no, no, I'll be right, mate. So I went up there and I tried to be this new person. I tried to, you know, a positive comedy, you know. Um, and my audience looked at me like, who, who the hell is this dude? And then someone started yelling and then someone else started yelling and I just ignored them and I moved on and I moved on and my inner critic's going, don't put up with this shit, mate. We're not putting up with this shit. And then da-da-da. And then someone pushed the wrong button and I went, bah! And the whole room erupted. Like I said something like faggot or something like that and the whole room erupted. And then my inner critic was back and for the next 40 minutes I just murdered this crowd with my old style of comedy. I drove home that night and I was crying the whole way home. And the reason I cried the whole way home was because I'd made a promise to these suicidal kids that I was gonna change and I couldn't even last five minutes. I got home and my wife saw the tears and she said, what's wrong? I said, and I told her about the day, I said, these kids and you know, this, this, this thing. And she goes, well, funny, because today, since you've been there, three other schools have rung up and said, can you go and speak? And I woke up in the morning and my wife said, look, I know you're upset now and I know you broke the promise, but let's talk about it in the morning. Let's get asleep and talk about it in the morning. Well, throughout the night, I'd rationalise everything that had gone on. I was on top of it again. You know, I could be this person here and I could be that person there. My wife comes to me and she goes, well, well, we need to talk about it. It's all right, doll. It's all right. Don't you worry your pretty little head over it. Um, I'll go back to saving the world. And she goes, no, none of that shit. We're talking about this. I've never seen you crying like that and we need to talk about it so she finally got to the hub of the matter and she goes I said well you know I think what's really the issue here is I've finally finally found something that I want to do 
I've finally found my calling and my purpose. These kids connected with me because my inner critic's 12 and, you know, they, they heard me. And I love this, but it doesn't pay any money. I've got this career now that I realise is toxic. It is killing me that I don't want to do, but it buys us whatever we need. So she goes, I've got the answer. She goes, what's that? She goes, we're going to quit that and we're going to do this. I was like, maybe you didn't hear me. <laughs> money, <laughs> no money. And she said, look, leave it to me. First thing we do is fire everyone. I said, what do you mean? Fire your manager, fire the accountants, fire the lawyers, fire the PR, fire, fire everybody. And she said, if we fire everybody over here, I guarantee you we save 100 grand. And with that 100 grand, we can have a crack at this and we can have a go at this. And I'm like, you sure? She goes, I'm your new manager. Shut up and go. <laughs> said, cool. So out I went. I went out to the thing there and the, the, the people were coming in. Schools were, Every school I spoke at, another school, three schools would ask me to come. And the, the people that were in charge of this were trying to put the schools off, but they persisted. And I was out there doing these talks and I finally found my, found my pers- purpose. My probation officer rang me up and says, hey, mate, your, your hours are so fuck you, I'm carrying on. You know, I, I love this. I'm just going to keep doing it. Uh, and then one day I got home and... Um, it's about four months in, I'm enjoying life, and I opened up the bank app, and we were $30,000 uh, overdrawn. We'd sold our house, we'd sold my motorbikes, my cars, we'd sold um, a, a little holiday batch that, that we had. Um, my wife's going, don't worry, we don't need these things. I'm living in a, in a rented house and not the good part of Papa Toy Toy in South Auckland, the eighth most violent city, uh, suburb in, in New Zealand. And I'm too embarrassed to tell my friends and I open up the app and we're $30,000 overdrawn. Well, I was broken because my dad had taught me my job is to protect, provide and give my kids a better opportunity and here I was, just another loser who had it all, brown and lost everything. And I was just sitting, I was in tears and my wife comes and he goes, what's the matter with you? I said, have you, have, you, have, you, have you seen this? Have you seen this? She went, yes, a bank app. I said, don't, don't play your stupid games if you've seen the number. That, that 30,000, that's red. That's red. That's not a good colour. That's, you fellas would know that shit. You, I mean, you know, you're, you're in charge of most of that shit. So I'm going, that, that's, that's not good. I want to go back and do comedy. I want to go back and do comedy. Let's build up the bank again and then we will go back. She said, hell no. Hell no. We're not doing that. I've got the solution. I said, okay, what's the solution? She goes, never open the bank app again. I'm the manager. And you go out and do your shit. And leave the finances to me. And I was like, but, no buts. We're in this together. You just get your ass out there and do your thing. So I went, okay. So I went out there and I worked. Six months later, she came back to me and she showed that our bank account was back in the black. And I was really taken aback. I was like embarrassed because I questioned, you know, the most important in my life, questioned the person who was the most important person in my life. And I went, oh, oh, wow, that's great, babe. I always, always believed you. <laughs> I should never have questioned you in the first place. Thank you, darling. I love you. Oh, this is so cool. And then I went, so, um, <clears throat> I know it was stupid, but what did you think when, when I brought it up in the first place? She goes, I shit myself. I had nothing. <laughs> I'm like, what? what do you mean you had nothing? I said, yeah. She goes, I shit myself. I had nothing. I had nothing. I had nothing. But I saw your face and I saw how much it meant to you. And there was no way in hell I was going to send you back out doing something that you don't want to do when we've found, finally found our purpose. So that just meant I had to get my shit together. I had to do a better job. That was, uh, that was 2014, 2000, yeah, 2014 when we had that conversation. Without my wife, I would never have been able to transition from, from comedy to, to here. And what I've learned 
in this journey is there are three really important things that you need when you want to transition. And if you don't have these three things locked down, you will fail. You will fail. The first thing you need is you need purpose. You need purpose. You need to believe what you're doing and not for financial reward. If you're choosing something because it's money and it's not your true purpose, you will never be any good at it. You will never be any good at it. It has to have purpose. What I learned in those three, because we went the next three years just living hand to mouth. I, I didn't get paid for any of these mental health talks that I was doing in the schools and communities. And we lived hand... I would never been so happy in my life. I'd been a millionaire. I had V8 motorbike. A V8 motorbike. I had four by fours, holiday homes, houses with big swimming pools. I had everything. I'd never been so miserable in my life. I was living in Papa Toy South with no money all day, baby. I was never been happier in my life. And my purpose was to do this thing, not for financial reward, for something much better, karma dollars. Karma dollars are the best, like nothing tops in the monetary world, karma dollars. So you've got to have purpose, you've got to have belief. Once you've got that and you've researched what you're going to do and you recognise the barriers, for me those barriers were the people that were working in the industry. The people who didn't want me to do what I was doing for free for fear of losing their funding. So work out where the barriers are. Once you've got it all locked down and you know what you're up against, then jump with both feet. Jump. Don't put your toe in the water. Don't put your toe in the water. Jump. How deep is it? Who cares? Who cares? Make it as deep as you want. Make it a whirlpool. I'm going to make it through. Jump. You've got to go with everything you've got. Don't go halfway because you'll drown. Jump, both feet. And the third and most important thing, and this is the part where most people make the biggest mistake. If you're going to change, if you're going to transition, take the people you love the most in the world with you. Take them with you. They have to share the journey. They have to be there. Most men make the mistake of going it alone without telling anyone for fear of upsetting our loved ones, for fear of them having stress. They know you're doing dumb shit. They know you're doing it. And if you're not taking them on the journey, even if you're successful, you will fail because she or he will be resentful that you didn't take them with you, that you didn't believe that they were worthy of coming with you. The reason I have got where I am today is because of my wife. She has stood by my side the whole way. She has watched me cry. She has watched me broken and she has glued me back together and she has kicked me out there and made me believe in myself. So if you're transitioning, please, 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 that last one is the critical one. And that's how you deal with change. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> Anyone want to ask a question? Is it plenty? No dumb questions, only dumb answers. Yes, sir. Those five kids you first saw. Where are they now? What are they doing? They're all, you know, one of them doing great, stayed in contact. They're all still alive. Where are they? They'll be having their ups and downs like everybody else, but they'll know now. They know that we're all in this together. You know, how many of you have got kids? So I grew up my whole life. My whole life I grew up, I thought I was unworthy. When I discovered comedy, it was the greatest day of my life, making people laugh. It finally gave me my value. And, you know, when I told my first joke and everyone laughed, this is a kid who who never felt like he was accepted, never felt like he was good enough, felt like he was a disappointment to his dad. To suddenly get this overwhelming wave of approval called laughter. Oh, my goodness. That was the greatest day of my life. That was day one of my comedy career. 
As it turned out, it was day one of my downfall. Why? Because that was the first day that I started to get my self-esteem and my approval from, 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 the, from the compliments of other people. Right? That was the first day other kids started to take control of my life. Here's what I'm going to tell you. 95% of your kids right now are getting their self-esteem and approval from, from other people. 95% of your kids are getting their confidence from the approval of other people. Why? Because they don't believe that they're good enough for you. They believe that they're disappointing you. They believe that they can't live up to that imaginary standard that they've set for themselves because of you. Lots of reasons for this. There's lots of reasons for this. Job, jobs have changed completely. This is the first generation of two parents working, obviously. Um, my mum was at home when I was at school um, and wasn't allowed to work till we'd all left home. Um, and that's how it was. And I mean, I, like that was factually what happened. My dad says, my, I work, you, you look after it, and when they're out, you can, you can go. Now, now all women are working. Our jobs have changed completely. Completely. No matter what your job title is now, our job descriptions are all the same. Risk managers. We're all risk managers, right? No, that's what we are. So no matter what job comes across your desk, right? First thing you go, what's the risk to me, the company, the customer, the environment, the children? Risk, risk, risk. Now the problem with risk management is this. We are now firmly focused, firmly focused on the 1% that can go wrong. 99% of what you do every day is perfect, but no one cares about that. We're all focused on the 1% that's gone wrong, could go wrong, or may go wrong. We are firmly, and, and, and no one realises the impact of this stuff. We're all at work every day, you know, and the boss is only ever focused on the one thing that went wrong, so you all go home, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling like you're not valued, you're feeling like nobody cares. Nobody cares and you're angry and you're frustrated and when you get home without you even realizing it, there's a power shift. And suddenly, oh yeah, I'm the CEO and all you little shits work for me. Who left that sock on the floor? What the hell, why are those dishes? Why didn't you bring that washing in when I told you to? How many people recognize that parent? Be honest, <laughs> be honest, be honest, be honest be honest, your kids come to you nowadays and without even realising you go into risk management mode. You want to climb a tree? You fell out of the tree yesterday, you moron. Get into your bloody bedroom. You want to go into town? Who's driving? Daryl. You're not getting into a car with Daryl. Daryl's a bloody dropkick. There's no way you're getting into a car. Sorry, who's that you want to go to? Paul. Paul's a drug dealer. Everyone knows that. You're not going to his place. Sorry, sorry. Alcohol, young lady. Alcohol. You're not going anywhere with this alcohol. You do I look like I fell down in the last shower? Little things that we say to our kids every day that we can justify in isolation. Well, you are a moron, mate. I asked you to bring me a screwdriver. What the hell did you bring me? A bloody teaspoon. Get your brother down here. Why? Because he's better than you at this shit. You're good at some other shit. We haven't figured out what that is yet. <laughs> Get your brother down here. Things that I can justify in isolation. But think about this. Two little put downs a day. Seven days a week. 365 days a year for 15 years. That's a hell of an inner critic you're placing in your child's head. Because how we speak to our children becomes their inner voice. How you speak to your children becomes their inner critic. The inner critic is the biggest problem in mental health today. The biggest problem in mental health. Where do you, where, where do you work? BNZ. BNZ. The biggest problem in your industry right now, the biggest problem in your family is an overactive inner critic. I know that there's a lot of people here, a lot of people here that are sitting there going, well, I'm not like that with my children. I'm a mate. We're all shit. We're all shit at parenting. Own up to it. I'm great with your kids. I'm shit with my own. Why do I, why I'm good with your kids? I don't love your kids. I'm good when I don't love the kid. I'm terrible when I love the kid. Your kid comes home. They tell you about five things that happened in their day, four are amazing, one's bad. What do you focus on, Paul? What do you focus on, Paul? <laughs> what do you mean you failed that maths test, Paul? 
Paul, I told you on Thursday you had to study for that test, didn't I, Paul? I told you on Thursday, but oh no, you and your stupid friends on your stupid bloody devices, and now look what happened, Paul. You're a failure, mate. You failed, didn't you, Paul? You wipe that smirk off your face, you ungrateful little shit. Oh my, oh, oh my, gee. We didn't have half the stuff that you've got now, Paul. Your father and I, we grew up in a cardboard box. We did, Paul. We did. Do you think all of this fell out of the sky, Paul? Do you think it all fell out of the sky? Do you think money grows on? Tr- Listen, mister, if you don't pull your finger out, if you don't put, you're, ne- you're never going to go to university, Paul. You're never going to, you know what you're going to do? You're going to work for the fucking BNZ. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> How we speak to our children becomes their inner voice. So my my message to everyone here is compliance in the way we work isn't going to change. Isn't going to change. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. But you don't have to take that home. You don't have to take that home. We can all be better parents. We can all be better with our kids. Don't take it home. When you get home, don't focus on the the one bad thing. Focus on the four good things and offer up tools of empowerment, how they can recognise what went wrong. Don't give them the answer, how they can recognise and improve on what went wrong. The biggest problem in mental health today is an overactive inner critic. And the only thing that can beat an overactive inner critic is kindness, kindness looking out for each other. When I was at my lowest, my inner critic had isolated me because this is what inner critics do. They isolate you. They get you in a room by yourself and have you believing that, that nobody cares and you have no value. When I was in that moment, my inner critic says, what's the point? My friend, a friend of mine, walked through the door and gave me my value back. He reminded me that I had purpose in his life and in other people's lives. He lifted me up. From that moment... I am learning now to be grateful. I'm learning to, when I'm overthinking something and my inner critic's getting the best of me, I go, jolt, which means you're going down a rabbit warren and it's nothing good's going to happen down there. And then I find someone who's in a service industry, someone who's mopping a toilet, and I go, how's your day? 99.9% of these people go, I'm good. How's your day? What an arsehole would I be if I went up having a shit day? Well, I don't see a rag in a bucket and you polishing the toilet, pal. What have you got to be? And it reminds me of things to be thankful for. And it's changed my life. It's changed my life. I had no idea, no idea that five years ago there were two dads in my kids' lives, the dad they loved and the dad they hated. I had no idea that when I got home from work, my kids would look down the end of the hall to see which dad is coming home. Is it the dad we love or the dad we hate? And if it's the dad we love, is he going to turn into the dad we hate any time soon? When I get home tonight, the only thing I'm going to hear when I walk into my house is, It's the king! It's the king! It's the king! Sure, it's going to be me saying it. But my kids are going to be running towards me with hope and love in their eyes, knowing, knowing that I'm going to value and validate their day. And if I could give you one thing, all I ever want for any of you is just one time that you could see your kids running towards you without fear, knowing that no matter what they tell you, No matter what they say, you're going to value and validate what they have to say. It is the greatest gift I can give you. But in order for that to happen, you have to change. You have to talk about your doubts and fears. You have to talk about your mistakes. You have to talk about your inner critic and normalise it so your kids know. That's the secret to good mental health. I love you. Thank you.